<laughs> Hello, this is David Sloan Wilson for This View of Life, the magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. I'm very pleased to have Robert Frank, the eminent economist from Cornell University, as my guest today, who has written many books, including um, uh, The Winner Take All Society, uh, Passion Within Reason, Falling Behind, uh, the Economic Naturalist, and most recent, The Darwin Economy, uh, his new book. So uh, welcome, Bob. Nice to be with you, David. And so I'm uh, so happy to talk about your new book. Why don't we just start right in and tell us, uh, tell us uh, what your new book is about. Okay, it's called The Darwin Economy, and the subtitle is Liberty, Competition, and the Common Good. And in it, I try to defend what will sound to most economists like a strange prediction. Anyway, it's one that I, I won't have to worry about uh, since I'm, I'm saying that a hundred years from now, if people survey professional economists and ask them who's the intellectual founder of your discipline, I'm predicting that a majority of them are going to answer Charles Darwin. Uh, not many would say that today. Most would say Adam Smith. So that's the thesis I try to defend in the book. And Basically, my argument is that Charles Darwin's view of the competitive process was subtly different from Smith, but profoundly more on target. So that, that's where the book goes. Right, absolutely. And I was uh, lucky to uh, have a chance to read a, a, a review copy before, uh, before it was published. So uh, we'll just expand upon this uh, theme. And by the way, I hope all of this happens sooner rather than later so that uh, <laughs> we can say that 10 years from now. Not, uh, and we could explain to people at this moment what this means because it does sound so strange. So what is this subtle difference and why does it make such a difference? Well, I should probably say at the outset that it's a bit of a straw man I'm attacking in my portrayal of Smith. I think Smith was a much more nuanced thinker than his modern disciples realize. Uh, I'm, I'm really attacking their vision of Smith much more than Smith himself. But, but I do part company with Smith in an important way, as, as will become clear. What the, the modern enthusiasts of unregulated markets think Smith said was that you can turn selfish people loose in the marketplace, let them pursue their own interests without restraint, and that process will generate the best possible results for society as a whole. Of course, Smith didn't believe any such thing. Uh, he thought that whenever men of the same trade got together, they would always hatch conspiracies to exploit their workers and their consumers and so on. So you needed government to restrain a lot of that malfeasance in Smith's view. That, that's more or less, by the way, the, the view of the modern left. When, when market outcomes go awry, it's because powerful actors somehow thwart competition and foist their will on people. Uh, that's not really the problem in the marketplace. I think if you listen to the right wing, uh, they'll say correctly that, look, markets are more competitive now than they've ever been. Maybe they're not perfectly competitive, but uh, it's much more like the unbridled competition that I think was the, the Smithian ideal. So if, if, that's, if that's where you think market failure lies, you're probably wrong. Uh, Darwin's view of competition uh, w was really a more general view than Smith's. Uh, he, he saw clearly that competition in nature molds traits that benefit the individual. Uh, sometimes those traits benefit the group. Uh, uh, there are vivid examples of that, and in, in, in those cases, the, the Darwinian narrative is, is really uh, very close to the Smithian narrative. So, for example, if you think about a, a gazelle. It's very fast. It can go 60 miles an hour in short bursts, 30 miles an hour for sustained periods. Why is it so fast? Well, it was chased by cheetahs who are even, even faster than that, and the ones who weren't fast uh, have long since been eaten and didn't pass their genes along. So, so gradually mutations accumulated in the gazelle that made it faster and faster and better able to escape from predators. Those genes got passed through the gazelle population. And gazelles as, as a group are much more fit as a result of being so fast. So there was no, no conflict really there between individual and group interests. But Darwin saw clearly, too, that there were many other traits, especially those that are, are molded to help individual animals do battle with members of their own species, that are shaped in ways that for the group as a whole is not advantageous. Uh, I, I, on the cover of the book, here, let me hold it up as a, a free ad for, for, uh, for your readers. They're, they've re reproduced a picture of two bull elk fighting. Uh, 
elk are polygynous species. D Darwin saw clearly uh, that they would take more than one mate when they could. If some take more than one mate, that means others don't take any at all, which of course is the ultimate loser slot in his framework. And so of course they'll, they'll seize any advantage available to, to help win those battles. And in their case, it turned out that having bigger antlers than the rivals was, was an advantageous thing in battle. And so mutations that coded for bigger antlers were selected very powerfully. Uh, and there, there's now an equilibrium. It hasn't been a, an, an arms race that continued completely without limit. They're about four feet across in the biggest versions, 40 feet. Uh, that's a horrible handicap for bulls as a group. If they're chased into a densely wooded area by wolves, they're, they're, they're done for. They're surrounded and killed without, without a contest. So if they could take a vote, and I know this has been the theme a lot of, of a lot of your work, they would immediately find it attractive to, to pass a referendum dictating that their antlers be cut back by half at the count of three. Uh, they can't do that, and so they're stuck with the outcome. Uh, but, uh, and as you and others have written, uh, groups who suffer at the, at the hands of individual emphasis and selection can often overturn those handicaps by organizing collectively and, and restraining behavior in ways that benefits the group. Where I see market failure in today's economy is not exploitation by monopolists, the, the, the left pundit's view, the, the Smithian view, even if you will. Uh, it's really much more a consequence of the fact that so many payoffs in the market system depend on rank. Uh, the, the individuals who come in slightly ahead of their rivals get a huge payoff compared to the payoffs their rivals get. And so they invest uh, heavily in all sorts of positional arms races. They try to sort of outdo their rivals with additional weaponry of one sort or another. And even in the consumption domain, we see rewards depending on rank. Uh, let, me, uh, let me reinforce that because I think the key difference here, and it's subtle but completely uh, foundational, is the distinction between absolute fitness and relative fitness and that uh, evolution is all about relative fitness. Economic theory, mathematically, in addition to intuitively, has been based on the maximization of absolute fitness, and that's the subtle difference that makes such a difference. Is that about it, right? It's, it's exactly the point, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's always been a, an intellectual puzzle to me how for so long economists could maintain that payoffs depend on absolute amounts uh, the way they do. I mean, is my interview suit okay? The, the answer to that question uh, depends on what kind of suits the other guys who want the same job I want are wearing. If they're wearing $2,000 suits and I show up in a $500 suit, my suit's not so good. I'm not going to get a call back. Now, the interviewer we're... won't know why he didn't like me, but, but, but the evidence shows that they're less likely to call you if you're wearing a, a lesser suit. So you want, you, want to, you want to look good, but that's a relative concept. Well, you do two things in the book, which I want to make sure is featured in this interview. One is is that you you turn this to um, practical tax policy. So this isn't just a theoretical argument. You have something very practical to recommend with respect to reforming uh, tax code. And number two, you you frame your argument as something that a thinking libertarian should agree with. So could you elaborate on both of those points? Sure, let's take the tax one. I'll just mention one of the tax proposals, uh, and it's, it's inspired by the idea that a lot of the consumption we see in the modern marketplace is wasteful in the sense that if everybody were to spend less in certain areas, there'd be virtually no sacrifice at all, and dollars could be freed up to spend on things that really would make a difference. Uh, one example, uh, I think, that captures the idea is is the is the coming of age party that a CEO staged for his daughter a few years ago. He spent he spent ten million dollars on the party. Three hundred of her friends gathered in the Rainbow Room above Rockefeller Center. Stevie Nicks performed. Fifty Cent performed. There were uh, bands for the parents' friends too. All the kids got a video iPod, which was at the time the the must-have gadget of, of that moment. Uh, they, they spent $10 million. I, I don't think he was a bad man. Maybe he was or he wasn't. I don't know the man. But I, I suppose it's possible to imagine that his only goal was to stage an occasion that made his daughter feel special. But 
when you've <laughs> when you've when you've got incomes on the scale of the ones earned by the people at the top, it takes ten million dollars worth of expenditure to to make a party seem special. Uh, the middle class doesn't seem to mind. They like reading stories about it. Occasionally, you'll see an outraged commentary. But, but basically, the people who are just below the very rich, they're influenced by this. That shifts their frame of reference. They spend more on their parties. And then before long, it's cascaded all the way down the income ladder. So now, professors, uh, if they're 10-year-olds, haven't had a clown or a professional magician to entertain their friends at their birthday party, they feel their parents don't love them. So everybody's spending more, yet the evidence, I think, is very clear on this. When everybody spends more along those lines, uh, nobody's having any more fun than everybody's when the expenditure fun. levels even were less. smaller. Even less. Mansions, it's the same thing. It's a pain in the ass to have a big mansion. Uh, it, you have to have a big staff. They're going to write tell-all <laughs> mem memoirs. There are security <laughs> issues. Why do you need a big mansion? Because people like you are expected to be able to entertain a certain style. But if everyone else had a smaller mansion, the bar would shift accordingly. So the, the tax proposal uh, rests on the idea that people aren't stupid. It really is relative consumption that, that drives how people feel about things. Let's just make it more expensive to stand out in those ways. So here's the proposal. Uh, you report your income to the IRS the same as now. We scrap the income tax altogether, but you still report your income to the IRS. Report your consumption just as you would for the year, just as you would for a IRA or a 401k account. We know how to do that. The difference between those two numbers, your income minus your consumption, that's how much you consume during the year. Then knock off a big standard deduction to acknowledge that people at low income levels don't aren't able to save much. So the, the privilege of being able to exempt savings from tax wouldn't be worth much to them. Let the rate start low, but then as the, as the total amount of consumption escalates, the rates keep going up. You don't have to worry about choking off savings and investment. On the contrary, this tax would be a, a, a big stimulus to additional savings and investment. And the guy at the top who's spending now four or five million a year, who's thinking about adding a $2 million wing onto his mansion, now he's got an extra thing to consider. If I build that, that extra wing, not only will I pay the contractor the $2 million bill for the job, I'm going to have to pay the tax authorities another $2 million for the tax on that consumption. So he says to himself, well, maybe the best thing to do under the circumstances would be to save some of that money and scale back. So he builds a $1 million addition. Everyone, <laughs> everyone else builds a $1 million 